Behringer is an audio equipment company founded by Uli Behringer in 1989 and since then they have become a multi-million dollar company with over 3,000 employees and factories on a scale that's hard to even comprehend. People live on site. There's an on-site supermarket and even a hospital. It's a mini city with a tribal attitude. They even have their own theme song. Behringer, along with a number of other brands, fall under the umbrella of Music Tribe, a holdings company based in the British Virgin Islands. They also fall under the Music Group Macau Commercial Offshore Limited Corporation, based in the Philippines. And that's just way too long to say. So, for the sake of this video, all of that is going to be referred to as Behringer. It's what a lot of people refer to it as anyway. They're no stranger to controversy. In fact, they're perfectly fine with it. They seem to be one of the few companies who openly embrace and utilize controversy as a way of marketing. And seemingly because of this, there are many controversies Behringer have been involved in. But because there are so many, they don't seem to have been documented together until now. This video is a long one and it's going to be made up of two sections. The first is all the controversies Behringer have been involved in and the public statements they made about those controversies at the time. The second is an exclusive statement from Behringer specifically written for this video, covering things they've never publicly covered before. This is Audio Audit Behringer. While no stranger to controversy, they're equally no stranger to accusations of copying either. There have been many lawsuits, some which they've lost, like the Apex Systems case, and some which they've won, like when PV accused them of copying. And then there's a number of cases with settlements made out of court, the most notable being the Mackie case in 1997, where Mackie accused Behringer of copying their mixers, and they won the initial suit. However, on appeal in 1999, the judge ruled that even though Behringer had copied their circuit boards, copyright didn't apply to circuit boards in the US. A non-financial settlement was made out of court. Then there was the time when Roland US accused Behringer of copying Boss pedals. Again, a confidential settlement was made out of court, but the Behringer pedals' appearance changed significantly. In more recent years, Behringer have seemingly embraced the idea of reverse engineering, cloning, and 100% exact replicating other people's designs. But we have to be careful when saying that, because they might sue for defamation. In 2017, there was a discussion on the forum formerly known as Gear Sluts about Behringer, and some people were rather critical of Behringer's behaviour. One such person was Tony Cara, an employee of Dave Smith Instruments, or DSI for short. Now to be fair, DSI are a competitor of Behringer. Both companies make synthesizers. However, the product in question has nothing to do with DSI. Tony personally drew the comparison between the Morley Ebtech cable tester and the Behringer cable tester, and Behringer sued him for it. To put this into perspective, it would be kind of like a Gibson employee saying he thinks the PRS Silver Sky looks like a copy of the Fender Stratocaster, and PRS suing both him and Gibson for saying that. A lawsuit for over a quarter of a million dollars in damages was brought against Tony Cara, his employer DSI, and it named 20 anonymous forum users who had also stated negative opinions about Behringer. So, what was said that was so false, libelous, and defamatory about Behringer? But what makes your CT100 different from the Ebtech cable tester? It looks like a blatant copy to me, except for the paint. Now this case never made it to court, but I ask you, members of the online jury, to like this video if you think that the CT100 looks like the Ebtech cable tester. The judge ruled that this was a slap suit, that's a strategic lawsuit against public participation. In other words, he deemed that they were using a lawsuit to intimidate and silence their critics. Hope they don't do that again. 
Also in 2017, Chinese music blog MIDI fan were sent a cease and desist by lawyers representing Behringer, accusing them of defaming Behringer by calling them shameless and copycats. MIDI fan translated the cease and desist and posted it online. Here are the highlights. They take issue with the titles of articles published by MIDI fan, such as Exclusive, Breaking, Behringer's recent crazy copycat stems from a trap of imitation chip more than a decade ago. Can't stop copycat, Behringer will make the Euro module next. Shameless, Behringer exhibited copycat of TR-808, etc. And they also said the same on a social media site, WeChat. The fact that you repeatedly used insulting words such as shameless, copycat has caused the reputation of my four clients to be seriously damaged. That's it. They used insulting words. Behringer's legal team also threatened to pursue them for criminal defamation, which can result in imprisonment in China. Behringer demanded a public apology, so MIDI fan released what might just be the snarkiest apology I've ever seen, and changed any words like copy to tribute in their articles. Behringer didn't pursue the case further, but that's not the interesting part of all this. Naturally, when a corporation threatens to sue a journalist for calling them a copycat, there'll be a lot of press coverage. And there was which was addressed via a statement by Uli Behringer. The statement covers three things, two of which we've already covered. The DSI suit, where Uli mentions that they only went through with the lawsuit because they sent a cease and desist to DSI and Tony Cara, where they agreed to remove the forum posts and not make any more defamatory remarks. But Tony allegedly continued to do so. So what was said that pushed them over the edge? Well, according to court documents, he said, Behringer had an obvious historical lack of integrity, which of course is entirely subjective and depending on your interpretation of integrity and the moral principles it encompasses, though the action of them suing someone for saying this does contradict a very recent statement where Behringer say that they will always respect that people may have their opinion about morals and ethics, however that's a subjective area that we won't engage in. Suing someone for questioning your morals does seem fairly engaging to me. Tony also said he was just pointing out the obvious history of copying products, and as previously covered, they do have a history of that, and that it's not beneath Behringer to duplicate a product, paint it a different colour, and give it a different name. There was a reason they lost this case. Can't really do much to defend the idea that a judge deemed the case to be a strategic use of the law to censor criticism, but Uli ensures us that he's a big believer in free speech. He also addresses the MIDI fan cease and desist, though with not too much new information. The language used was insulting and offensive, and seemingly even more insulting in Chinese culture. Uli does not like media insulting his employees. Sticks and stones does come to mind though, they did quite literally threaten criminal prosecution because they were insulted. The most interesting part about this statement though is that it spends more time talking about something that we haven't covered. It was a story also covered by MIDI fan. A strike in the then new Music Tribe factory. The very basics of the MIDI fan report are as follows. Employees were feeling dizzy shortly after moving to the new factory. They wanted to open windows but were repeatedly told not to. Unfortunately, about one month after moving to the new factory, one employee became sick and was diagnosed with acute leukemia. Some employees suspected formaldehyde in the air to be the cause, so one bought a meter to check. They checked the factory and in some places in the factory, the meter said that the levels were 10 times higher than the amount that they should be. They were still told not to open the windows, but Behringer hired a third party to check the air quality in the building. When the employees found out that this third party had had their license revoked by the Chinese government and were using outdated equipment, they then went on strike. This was covered by some media outlets, and Uli wrote a dedicated statement about it. Uli's statement starts by talking about how Behringer don't pay for advertising in music magazines, and this has resulted in unfair and biased reporting against them, heavily implying that this is just one such instance. And this might hold weight if the news story wasn't broken by a news channel on Chinese TV first. <laughs> And furthermore, it was also reported by the Chinese Labour Bulletin, a site that doesn't run any ads as far as I can tell and certainly has nothing to do with music. And they painted a much darker picture of events, 
with employees saying that they felt threatened by management and police being called to the protest. Uli does mention the employee having leukemia but blames the other workers lack of medical education for causing panic resulting in the strike. Now I'm not sure where Dr. Uli got his medical license from but I don't think it's the same place as the doctors at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Centre did. They say that acute leukemia which is reportedly what the employee was diagnosed with can develop quickly and progress in days to weeks which fits the timeline. Making the only medically uneducated person in this instance Mr. Berenger himself. I find it somewhat ironic that he doesn't like when people insult his employees but had no problem undermining their intelligence in a very public statement when they had reason to be concerned. He states they did tests and found no hazardous chemicals in the air and the employees are back working in the factory. The sick employee is recovering and they're paying for his treatment. Uli then links a job portal with favourable reviews about working at Music Tribe as evidence to how his employees are treated and finishes by letting us know that if we want to talk to any Music Tribe people, to just contact them. It's incredibly difficult to fact check what either side says about this story because of the language barrier. What we do know is that there is evidence, albeit in a different language, but it was enough evidence to have this story run on Chinese TV. I asked Berenger more about this later on in the video with their statement, but what we know now is that everything was resolved and the employees were back working in the factory. But what I want to draw your attention to is the call for people to talk to employees and the favourable reviews in a job portal. If you want to know what it's like to work at a company, the best people to ask are of course the employees. They'll tell you the good, the bad and everything in between. One of the most popular employee review sites is Glassdoor. It's intended to be a place for past and present employees to leave an anonymous review of their place of work. And on this site, Behringer and Music Tribe don't exactly have the best scores. Behringer with a recommend to a friend score of 7% certainly has room for improvement. There are also a number of scathing reviews with very severe criticism. Uli has talked about Glassdoor reviews before and he's made some very valid points. Anyone can post anonymously without any verification. One person can post as many times as they want and anyone can pretend to be an employee and write a fake review. All very true and something to consider, however it might be a double edged sword, as some reviews on the site even claim that Behringer write fake reviews and Uli makes employees write positive reviews. I must admit that in the months I've spent working on this video Behringer's score has jumped up significantly. And it does strike me as rather strange to see multiple 5 star reviews posted within days of each other, but even more strange to see 4 posted on the same day. What are the chances that 4 employees would all decide to review their employer with 5 star reviews on that day? Uli tells us that if we want to know more about working at Music Tribe, to simply go to the Music Tribe Facebook group, and if we want to talk to any employees, to simply just contact them. This message is mirrored under most of the negative reviews on Glassdoor. Taking a look at the Music Tribe group, it comes across as little more than a PR campaign, with testimonials from employees being posted by the Music Tribe page itself. It's likely the last place you would expect to see, well, any negative views about anything. So the last place to look for information is to talk to an employee directly. We're encouraged to do so. But I don't think we're ever going to hear anything negative said about Behringer or Music Tribe by any employee, past or present, at least publicly. I've got a document to show you. In 2014, Behringer sued one or more John Doe's for posts they made on Twitter. We'll be looking at this case in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but part of the suit was the belief that whoever was making these disparaging remarks on Twitter was a current or ex-employee. One of the claims in the suit is breach of contract, a contract I hold in my hand. Because every employee has to sign a non-disparagement clause within that contract. The contract was used as evidence and so became public record, and the clause is as follows. Non-disparagement clause. Employee hereby agrees that employee shall not make any disparaging remarks concerning company's actions or perceived omissions regarding the agreement or otherwise take any action that would disparage or cast doubt upon the business acumen or judgment of the company. 
Further, employee acknowledges that the company's business and reputation are of special, unique and extraordinary character, which gives company a particular value, the loss of which cannot be reasonably be compensated in damages in action at law. In this particular case, the breach of contract was valued by Behringer at no less than $100,000. That's for disparagement, meaning that if any employee spoke about Behringer in a way that disparaged them, i.e. cast them in a negative light, well, they'd be technically in breach of their contract. So while Glassdoor most certainly has its negatives, it's really the only place where an employee can speak publicly about the negatives. Uli invites us to talk to employees, but this is where I have to get hypothetical. If I hypothetically spoke with any employees and they hypothetically had negative things to say, then they'd obviously require anonymity, something I'd be willing to and would provide. However, if I used them as sources for this video and a lawsuit was filed against me by Behringer, and judging by past actions, it is something that I have to be cautious about. I could be compelled by Irish law to give up my sources, ultimately exposing these employees to potentially $100,000 lawsuits for breach of contract. That's not something I'm willing to do. So Glassdoor is the best inside look that I can offer. All the sources for this video are public and linked in the description below. In 2014, Behringer took a federal case against one or more John Doe's for parody accounts made on Twitter, at NotUliBehringer and at FakeUli. Behringer attempted to have Twitter remove these accounts, but Twitter refused as they didn't break Twitter rules. Instead, Behringer decided to take it to court to try and remove the anonymity of the account owners. It failed. But the claims that Behringer make are very, very serious. Violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, unfair competition, trademark infringement, cyber piracy, interference with contractual relations, defamation, breach of contract, that was the contract we looked at earlier, and copyright infringement. That's a lot for a few tweets, but they must be very serious tweets, right? What's the most used piece of equipment at Behringer? Give up? The copy air. Ha ha. Only funny. Hashtag laugh or you're fired. When I wake up surrounded by prostitutes, I have to take a moment to figure out whether I'm at home or at Behringer. Hashtag, either way is good. The text to speech couldn't pronounce this one right. Last night, I was letting the Tone King rub oil on my thighs, and I had a thought. Bugera amps really do suck. No. No, very, very serious tweets. There was even a fart joke. Uh, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, a fart joke at a federal level. I'd like to point out that Behringer made the case that these tweets were available for millions to see. The at Uli account made 24 tweets in its lifetime and received a total of 4 likes. But because they brought this to court, those tweets became public record, equally available for millions to see. It's a bit of the Streisand effect. The tweet the judge took the most serious was this one. We here at Behringer are all about one thing, domestic violence and misogyny. Wait, that's two things. It was in reference to this advert made by Behringer. Chestin, aren't you ready yet? We're going to be late. If we don't leave now, we'll lose our receipts. Hello. Hey, I want to go now. Move your ass. Look at me when I'm talking to you, asshole. Bring on your words, baby. I've had enough. What? It's a Behringer. Here's what the judge had to say about it. The point is that the video is comedic. Whether funny or not is another question. In this context, there is no way to see it fake Hooli's comment as anything other than joking and ironic. It does not fall outside the First Amendment for being in poor taste. The judge denied Behringer's motion. Before we move on though, I would like to draw your attention to this. A claim made by Behringer that by the Twitter accounts using the name Uli Behringer, 
customers will likely suffer confusion or will actually be confused, mistaken or deceived. That's important, remember that for later. Now the bulk of this point will be covered in a separate video and in a lot more detail. The basics of it though are this. Behringer have been using famous brand names and logos on their own products, not by buying the brands outright or licensing the names, but by simply trademarking them. They tried it with famous synth brand name Oberheim and with historically important speaker brand Aritone. Once they trademarked the name, they then made very similar products to what Oberheim or Aritone made or make respectively, and put the same names on them. An example, Tom Oberheim made the famous Oberheim OBXA synthesizer, and Behringer made the Oberheim OBXA synthesizer. It's safe to say it's a little bit confusing, so confusing in fact that the US trademark office denied Behringer's trademark for Behringer Oberheim, as it might falsely suggest a connection to Tom Oberheim. Since then, Behringer and Tom Oberheim have been in talks, and Behringer plan to return the name Oberheim to Tom Oberheim. Quick update, they have. The Behringer prototype Oberheim OBXA is now the Behringer UBXA. It's a very similar yet entirely different and more complex situation with Aratone. In 2005, when Jack Wilson, Aratone founder, died, the trademarks he filed expired, and in 2012, Behringer claimed them. In 2011, Behringer made the Baritones, an Aratone tribute. I say tribute because no one would get the two confused and believe that the Behringer Baritone was made by Aratone. It would be very hard to confuse the two. They even said Behringer on the back. And while Behringer had the trademark since 2012, they didn't use it. Not until 2014, when Aratone heir Alex Jacobson attempted to get the trademark back for use in the family business. The legalities are complex and interesting, hence deserving of its own video. But there have been several federal lawsuits and has been going on since 2014, and only just now has the situation finally been resolved in Aratone's favour through arbitration. But the legalities are for a different video. Here I simply want to look at Behringer's approach with a critical eye. These are Aratone speakers, and these are Behringer's Aratone speakers. The same product that was once labelled Behringer is no longer. It's also no longer just a possibility that this might cause confusion amongst customers. It has caused confusion. These are not licensed. They're not a collaboration. It is simply Behringer taking a historic name and writing it on their products. From that alone, you could argue that Behringer are trying to mislead customers into thinking that they're buying products from an original brand when they're not. But that argument becomes even stronger when you look at the bios written on the Music Tribe website. We at Oberheim believe in continuously innovating and building the best synthesizers that musicians will truly love. Major artists include Rush, Nana, Styx, Queen, Madonna, and Jean-Michel Jarre. Oberheim was founded in 1969 by Tom Oberheim who started by creating ring modulators and phase shifters. Now I'm going to stop that right there. That's all factually true. Tom Oberheim did start Oberheim in 1969 and all those artists did use his products, but they were his products that they used. Behringer have absolutely nothing to do with any of that. And it comes across that they're not just taking the name, they're trying to take the legacy too. Unfortunately, it's the same with Aratone. We at Aratone believe in providing you with amazing audio products at truly amazing prices. Major artists include Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, etc. founded in 1958. Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones most certainly used Aratones, and Aratone was founded in 1958. Did Behringer have anything to do with any of that? Absolutely not. MJ and Quincy used Aratones before Behringer even existed. And Michael Jackson had died before Behringer even trademarked the name. And at that, all they did was trademark the name. I deem these actions to be nothing but misleading, and from a company that says they're customer obsessed and put the customer above all else, it's very hard to see these actions as anything but doing that. As previously mentioned, Behringer made the case that Twitter parody accounts using the name Uli Behringer in part would mislead customers, and if they truly believe that, then what's the thought process here? 
The battle for these names has been going on for years, since 2014 for the Aratone trademark. They lost it in Europe, but have since applied for it in a different category. And it's been reported that Behringer have trademarked a number of famous names used by other companies. I expect this behaviour to continue. Update, since speaking with Behringer and the arbitration siding with the original Aratone, both Oberheim and Aratone brands have been removed from the Music Tribe site. More will be explained in Berger's statement later in the video. Peter Kern is a musician, owner of small synth brand Meblip, and music tech journalist. He established himself as a thorn in Behringer's side way back in 2005 when he wrote an article critical of both Behringer's ethics and quality. He's continued to be critical of Behringer's clones since, but I think this quote sums up his thoughts perfectly. My plea to Behringer, kick your copying habit, if you can. I could forgive you if you didn't keep doing it over and over again. That suggests to me, and many others, that it's malicious, that you hope customers won't notice and will buy your cheaper version because, cosmetically, it looks the same as something else. If it really is different, and if it really is better, then that only makes this more of a tragedy. It seems like genuine disappointment in a company that certainly has the ability to make original and innovative designs, but instead chooses to follow others. Peter was the first to break the DSi suit. He was also the first to publish the MIDI fan cease and desist letter, and he continued to publish things that were negative about Behringer, including their trademark activity. That was in late November 2019. In early December 2019, Behringer filed for the trademark of the name Kern. They trademarked his name, meaning that if he wanted to use that name on a synth in the community that he spent years in, he'd have to file for an objection and likely start a legal battle with Behringer. Behringer then began taunting him, announcing on Facebook that they had trademarked his name, then by making several Facebook posts mocking Kern synths. And finally, by releasing this video of a 3D rendered synth called the Cork Sniffer. This is a story that you may have heard of because of the sheer amount of backlash it received. Many people accused Behringer of anti-Semitism because of the imagery that the product used. However, I think a lot of doubt can be cast on this accusation. First and foremost, Peter Curran isn't Jewish. But secondly, how would Behringer know if he was? People claim that the name Curran was a Jewish name, but in my research I couldn't find anything confirming this. There was a village in Germany called Kern, and it does have a strong Jewish history, but other than that, I'm finding more evidence suggesting that the name Kern was from Celtic origin. If I couldn't find any fixed information about the name, I doubt Behringer could either. The problem with such a serious allegation is once it's disproven or doubt is cast upon it, it can be used to dismiss all the other criticisms. Behringer took that video down and released a non-apology apology, where they denied any anti-Semitism intent, which is fair enough. I doubt there was an intent there, more so just stupidity. However, it does read like all the blame is put squarely on the marketing team. But I don't think that's quite the case. I found evidence to suggest that at least in part, this campaign against Kern came from the top down. When Behringer filed for a trademark for the name Kern, it was filed by an employee. But not just any employee. It was filed by Frank. Frank is the longest serving employee at Music Tribe with 28 years of service, and he's the head of the German division of Behringer. He's a tribe leader. This evidence suggests that the Kern campaign came from the top down. We don't know how far up it goes, but it certainly wasn't something the marketing team thought up themselves. And I for one personally believe that there may have been something bigger in the works, and it would have gone ahead if there wasn't such an uproar after they released the Cork Sniffer video. After all, they did trademark his name, and kept the trademark for months, only releasing it after the backlash came about. And the apology was deleted the same day it was posted. As you can see, Behringer have cease and desisted and sued critics in the past, but they opted for a different approach with Peter. And it seemed to have worked. I, like many others, reached out to Peter Curran for comment and received no reply. In fact, he hasn't covered any stories about Behringer since this all happened. Their biggest critic is silent. Update was silent. Just a few days ago, Peter wrote his first article mentioning Behringer since the Cork Sniffer incident, an article about Aratone winning their trademark battle. Let me be crystal clear where the criticisms lie. Behringer copy. 
Some people like this, some people don't. It's open for a debate with many variables, and it's not one that this video is about. The fact is that Behringer copy. There's a legal history of it. They even admit to it. Albeit semantically, but a 100% exact replication is a 100% exact copy. So creating a campaign against a journalist who is critical of this practice is worrying to say the least. But it works as a good deterrent. I know people who have been afraid to talk about this and I myself have had to be very careful with what I say and how I say it. In the months of me scripting this video, I've had to play 4D chess, thinking about how Barringer would respond to certain things I say. In the past, people who have said what I've said have been labelled as haters by Barringer, or even cork sniffers, people who have too high opinion of themselves to ever use any Barringer gear. I'm actually a big fan of Barringer's surface level ethos. The idea of making gear affordable for anyone to play music through is a great, fantastic idea that I back 100%. And I actually think the gear is good too. I'm recording the audio on a Behringer interface. In fact, I've recorded the audio for every video I've ever done on a Behringer interface. So I took the information I had and reached out to Uli Behringer personally for comment on this video. At first there were concerns that I was being paid by a competitor. I'm not. But once we got that cleared up, they were very helpful and forthcoming with information. I got to talk with Russell Tarlington from Seed IP Law Group, Music Tribe's US Council, and I managed to secure an exclusive statement from Behringer about all the topics that are raised in this video. They were nice enough to allow me to ask some follow-up questions too. So you're probably sick of hearing my voice by now, so I've asked a YouTube colleague and friend Omegon to read this one out. Warning. It's quite a long statement. So, one, the DSI lawsuit and subsequent slap. Some time ago, a DSI sequential employee, Tony Cara, posted false and slanderous statements about our company and products on multiple forums, which multiple customers brought to our attention. We put both the employee as well as DSI sequential on notice and received an apology letter from DSI as well as a signed letter of undertaking from the individual in which we were assured he would refrain from future such activities. Please find attached copies from the DSI and Tony Cara. In the official reply from DSI Sequential, the company stated that it had instructed all its employees to stop making any false or derogatory statements against us. Unfortunately, and despite the signed letter of undertaking, the individual continued making defamatory statements, which forced us to take legal action. If the employee had stopped his actions as agreed, the case would have never escalated. It is important to understand that this was not a legal action against a mere individual, but a representative of a competitor. Any such false and disparaging comments made by a DSI sequential representative are considered slander and damaging, as it pertains to a highly competitive market. The media had claimed that we had taken legal action against forum users, which is false. No other person was ever involved, and adding 20 John Doe's is a standard process in a legal process to find out if there are more employees involved. We later lost the case because that individual was a DSI sequential contractor and not a formal employee, and under Californian law, his actions were protected by the right of, air quotes, free speech, end air quotes. However, this slap law is particular to the state of California and would have likely been ruled differently in other states. 2. The MIDI fans cease and desist. Midi Fan is a China online magazine, which in December 2017 posted the following article. Not only was this article raised by our Chinese employees, but also readers of the Midi Fan website itself, who felt compelled to contact us. Publishing pictures of a cancer-fighting colleague in a hospital bed caused deep concerns among our people, a circumstance which is also illegal in China. The report also included a false narrative of the strike combined with a highly offensive language used. 
We sent the owner of the publishing site a cease and desist letter, but he was never sued as wrongly reported. At that time, we had spoken with the publisher and he promised to remove the offensive language, which he never followed through. Our employee welfare and integrity had been severely questioned by MIDI fan, which was amplified as it was later repeated by other media outlets. If anyone is interested about our culture, feel free to visit us as we have an open-door policy. We also like to list our employer ranking here. Number one, employer found for sound equipment. Number three, employer for electronics manufacturing. Number 11, employer among all companies in Zhongshan. According to media reports on the cease and desist letter MidiFan received, MidiFan claimed it was for using insulting language such as copycat and shameless in their articles about several Behringer products. They apologised for this and changed the language in those articles. Was there a separate cease and desist in relation to their reports on the factory strike? This statement makes it seem like there was. The MidiFan article used several other slurs, which were not only highly offensive but also illegal under Chinese law. We only issued a single cease and desist letter, and after MidiFan apologised, we reached out to him with an invitation to visit us so we could show him the factory, which he however declined. 3. The Music Tribe Factory Strike and Media Coverage of This When we moved into our new Music Tribe factory in October, within two weeks one of our engineers got unfortunately hospitalised with leukaemia. Everyone with some medical knowledge understands that this form of disease cannot develop within this short period. However, a rumour in the factory spread that the employee got sick due to toxic air pollution in the new factory. Fear spread among the workforce to the point that they went on strike, which lasted from the 6th of December 2017 to the 18th of December 2017. The government immediately stepped in and ordered a thorough emission test by an accredited third-party lab. The results demonstrated that all our emission levels were below the legal limits, upon which the factory was reopened. The government published an official message, linked here, and on the 19th of December 2017, it informed all staff of the factory clearance. We paid for the medical bills, and luckily the employee recovered and returned to work on the 1st of July 2020. Ultimately, the employee resigned on the 18th of November 2020. According to the MidiFan report of the strike, they claim that the employee was hospitalised with acute leukaemia. Doctors who specialise in cancer say that this form of leukaemia develops quickly and progresses over days to weeks. That information seems to fit the timeline in which the employee became ill. With this in mind, do you think the other employees' fears seem justified? We cannot comment on the actual medical condition of the employee, as it falls under privacy laws. However, it is also irrelevant, as all tests have evidenced, that there was no air contamination. The employee was a mechanical engineer who worked in the office building, and after he fortunately recovered, he returned to work. In the many decades of operating our factory, no other leukemia case has ever occurred. The MIDI fan report also mentions that Music Tribe hired a third party to test air quality in the factory, but this third party was using outdated equipment. After this, the government stepped in and ordered more testing and issued a fine to Music Tribe. Is there any truth in these claims made by MIDI fan? Initially, a third party lab was contracted to undertake the measurements, but after concerns from employees related to independence, this service was halted. The government recommended an accredited third party. The test that lasted several days and included over 2,000 sensors across all buildings demonstrated that the air quality was well within limits. The government made all test results publicly available, which were further scrutinised by supervising worker organisations. There was no fine from the government relating to this issue. We are very proud of our state-of-the-art factory, which is built based on Western industrial standards. This includes sustainability measures, such as on-site wastewater recycling, electric buses, in-house EHS team, medical facility, etc. Government regulations require annual factory and EHS environment health and safety certifications, which we have all passed. Our employees' well-being is at our utmost priority, 
and this includes the many foreigners that live and work on site. Yuli himself was based in the China factory for almost a decade, while also overseeing the new factory construction. Here is a video that provides an insight, and as mentioned earlier, we welcome everyone to visit us and speak to our people. 4. Glassdoor Employee Reviews It is important to first understand what Glassdoor is. It is an employer review site where people can anonymously post comments. Since it is anonymous, everyone can post anything and you'll typically find reviews from disgruntled employees, but also competitors or simply people who don't like the company. To be clear, we absolutely believe that there are legitimate posts of current and ex-employees on Glassdoor, and we acknowledge that certain criticism is absolutely justified. We are currently not perfect, but we are working hard to constantly improve the well-being of our people. However, we also know that many posts stem from people who never worked for us, since locations or job titles are mentioned that never existed. One has to ask the question how relevant 150 reviews are compared to the 3,000 employees' views. If you want to know more about our culture and people, we recommend to directly speak to our employees, either through LinkedIn, Facebook, etc., or by visiting our open-door offices. We are very proud of our people, many of which have been with us for more than 20-plus years. Some of the reviews on Glassdoor have accused Music Tribe of writing fake positive reviews on the site. How would you respond to these accusations? While we encourage our employees to share their experiences on multiple public forums, we do not create any, air quotes, fake, end air quotes, reviews. We welcome anyone to visit our, I've got to do the air quotes again, haven't I? Open door, no, I'm not doing it. Open door offices. Contact people on social media and form their own independent opinion. 5. The non-disparagement clause in the Music Tribe employee contract. These clauses are standard clauses in standard employee agreements of mature organisations. After encouraging people to speak with Music Tribe directly, would you exercise your right to sue the employees for breach of contract if they publicly express disparaging opinions about working at Music Tribe? I ask this because while glass doors have their inherent problems, as you have stated, some employees may feel that anonymity is the only way they can freely express their criticisms. Music Tribe previously used the non-disparagement clause against the John Doe's who were suspected employees of Music Tribe in the Twitter lawsuit. We have never taken any legal action against any current or former employees based on the non-disparagement clause for merely voicing opinions about the company's working conditions. The Twitter case was a completely different situation and has no relation to the open door policy and allowing employees to state their opinions about the company. We welcome our people to publicly share their experiences with Music Tribe. While we are certainly not perfect and never will be, we are determined to constantly improve and make Music Tribe a great workplace for our people. 6. The lawsuit against anonymous Twitter parody accounts at fake Yuli at not Yuli Berenger. Many years back after we closed a large US office, a fake account emerged with the purpose of parodying Yuli Berenger. We generally have no problem with parody and in some cases find it even amusing. However, in this particular case, confidential and sensitive company information was published, which forced us to take legal action. Again, we don't have a problem with parody and side with P.T. Barnum. Say anything you like about me, but spell my name right. 7. Using the name Oberheim on prototype synths and listing it as a brand on the Music Tribe site. It is important to understand the background of the Oberheim trademark history. In 1985, when Oberheim went bankrupted, Gibson acquired all assets and rights to the brand name. The new owner initially developed new synthesizers together with Viscount, etc., but ultimately ceased operation. For decades, the Oberheim brand was left unused, while Tom Oberheim had also stopped manufacturing products. Under trademark law, the owner loses the right to the mark if it hasn't been used for more than three years. While Gibson initially offered the marks for sale to us, we rejected the offer and instead registered the brand globally. 
while challenging Gibson in court in a subsequent court proceeding. We were awarded the brand's name for Europe and other jurisdictions. Recently, Tom Oberheim reached out to us since he plans to manufacture products again, and we are in the process of returning all marks back to him at no cost. 8. Using the name Aura Tone on speakers, resulting in people assuming licensing or collaboration. Over 10 years ago, we were looking for an abandoned speaker brand for low-cost speakers and came across Aura Tone. At that time, the trademark was in the hands of two individuals who had registered the mark, which they had previously used for electronic products. We discussed a potential licensing deal, however, this negotiation did not succeed. Since the brand had not been used for many years, we applied for cancellation due to non-use, and succeeded in most jurisdictions. At a very late stage, a relative of the Oratone founder suddenly claimed rights to the mark. After a lengthy process, an arbitrator reviewed the evidence and was persuaded that the relatives of the Oratone founder had not abandoned the mark despite years of non-use. 9. Listing both companies' original legacies on the Music Tribe site. Brackets, i.e. and, I think, quote, Oberheim was founded in 1969 by Tom Oberheim, and listing famous artists that used original Oberheim and Oratone products. End bracket. Since we are the rightful owner of both marks in some jurisdictions, showing the history of the brands is appropriate and legitimate. 10. The cork sniffer controversy. That's a thing. Peter Kern is the owner and editor of a German online magazine called CMD that deals with musical instrument products. Peter and Yuli have a 20-year history, and though both have never met, the relationship had been highly contentious. For decades, the commercially run magazine CMD published unflattering and at times derogatory articles, both about the brand and Yuli Berenger himself. At times, Yuli tried to reach out and offer an open conversation, which Peter Kern declined, while continuing his attack on the brand and Yuli. At some time, the marketing team and Yuli decided to run what was meant as a parody of Peter Kern, depicting him as Pinocchio, who would mischaracterize the company and its products. We have attached excerpts from his CMD posts. This is the attached document I received from Behringer linking to articles going back as far as 2005 up to 2019 written by Peter Kern. Some contain quite harsh statements like, Behringer, already a notorious rip-off artist but others being what I would consider tame. Behringer has been awfully hit or miss, with some great kit, some crap, mixers ranging from so-so to lousy. Remember, this is a music journalist. If he thinks some gear is great and other crap, it's his job to say it. The campaign backfired and the company admitted that it was poor judgment. Within hours, Yuli posted a public apology to Peter and removed all content. 11. Accusations of anti-Semitism this is so far-fetched that it's not even worth responding. The image reflects a caricature of Peter Kern who is not Jewish, with his beard and glasses and an attached Pinocchio nose. Anyone not familiar with Pinocchio and may want to look it up. 12. Trademarking Peter Kern's name and the idea that this was planned from fairly high up in the company, Frank Berenger tribe leader applying for the trademark. The mark was registered in Class 15 for synthesizers and, again, meant to purely poke Peter Kern. No one ever planned to make a real product under his name. The trademark was later cancelled. 13. The apology and deletion of said apology within a day. The said video was broadcasted only for a few hours, and after Yuli publicly apologised on Facebook, the whole thread was removed a day later, which included the apology. Many magazines had picked up on Yuli's apology, which can be read to this day. Once again, we regret this action as it was thin-skinned and inappropriate, and we once more apologise to Peter Kern. Well, you were right, this was long. Ugh. Right. Thank you for letting me feature. As a reward, I'd like you to now tell me where on the guitar the B string is. I'm joking, of course. Ta-ta for now. So, a big thank you to Omegon for reading out that statement, and a big thank you to Uli and Russ for working with me to release that statement. 
that's the video. If you watched this far, you should probably subscribe. For those of you who are interested in supporting the work that I do, I've just launched a YouTube members option where you'll get access to videos before anyone else and a bunch of other perks too while supporting the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.